Shalom and Chag Sameach. We greet you on the eve of the festival of Shavuot, the festival of weeks, which is the anniversary of the Sinai revelation, the giving of the Torah to Israel at Mount Sinai. Festival of Shavuot is one of the three pilgrimage festivals wherein the entire nation of Israel ascends to the Holy Temple to be seen there by God. And the festival of Shavuot, perhaps even more than Pesach or Sukkot, is so intimately connected with Eretz Israel, with the land of Israel, because it's marked by the bringing of the first fruits. Of course, the major component today of the festival of Shavuot is the fact that this is the time of the giving of the Torah. And we know the principle of understanding the cycle of the Hebrew calendar, and indeed the principle of understanding our lives and our connection to God through the Torah is that the Torah is constantly being given to us in our lives and that the Torah is the story of our lives. So now that we have been literally counting our days and making our days count for seven full weeks of anticipation, the 49 days of the counting of the Omer from Passover to Shavuot, and we've reached this tremendous climax of anticipation of this wedding, as it were, of the chuppah of Mount Sinai, where the entire nation of Israel literally weds to the God of Israel, and the ketubah, the marriage contract, is the Torah itself. We understand that when we observe a festival, we are not simply remembering something, observing an anniversary, or commemorating an event from long ago, but we are actually reliving the Sinai experience, so that we are receiving the Torah anew. And that's really the challenge of the sensitivity that we need to be connected to Hashem all the time. That's really the definition of a religious experience, to be sensitive and to see ourselves in that moment. So the question is, if Shavuot is the anniversary of the receiving of the Torah, and we want to really feel that we were there, and we want to really renew our commitments to Torah, we want to really see to it that our walk with Hashem is as best as it could be, what do we do? And what does it mean to really receive the Torah? Or maybe, what is the Torah exactly that we are receiving? And you know, it's interesting that there is actually a spiritual concept that is emphasized by our sages of blessed memory, that although Rosh Hashanah, the new year, is the time of, a, of the decree on both individuals and nations, the entire world. You know, everything is really decided on Rosh Hashanah, the new year. Everybody knows that. But actually, that's only more kind of like a physical decree of how things are, are going to play out. But the spiritual Rosh Hashanah of the entire year, our sages tell us, is Shavuot. In other words, the way a person rolls on Shavuot, the way we flow with that, the way we anticipate and receive and behave on that holiday is how our entire year is going to go. We are kind of judged because actually Shavuot is called the time of the judgment of the fruits, and metaphorically we are the fruit ourselves. So there's a concept that the way our Shavuot goes, spiritually, is how our year will go. So this is a very, very intense idea. So how best can we honor the festival? And where do we fit in with our renewal? And renewal is the key word here, as we'll see. Our renewal of the acceptance of the Torah, our covenant at Mount Sinai. What else do we know about Shavuot? We know that it is the anniversary of both the birth and the passing of King David. And there is a, an inexorable bond between King David, his essence, his spirit, and thus the soul of Mashiach itself, which comes into the world, and the festival of Shavuot. This is one of the reasons why we read the Megillah, the scroll of Ruth, who is the mother, as it were, the forebear of David on Shavuot. We know that Shavuot, again, is the time of the bringing of the first fruits. When we read in Parshat Emor, 
in Leviticus 23 about Shavuot, beginning with Sfirat Omer, we read, You shall count for yourselves from the morrow of the rest day, which of course is referring to Passover, according to our sages, from the day when you bring the Omer of the waving, seven weeks, they shall be complete until the morrow of the seventh week. You shall count fifty days, and you shall bring a new meal offering to Hashem. From your dwelling places you shall bring bread that shall be waved, two loaves made of two-tenth efa. The verses describe this unique offering, the unique additional holiday offering on Shavuot, which is two loaves of wheat bread. This is very unusual. It's the only time that leaven is actually brought in the Holy Temple. And this is a huge spiritual concept, the idea that we have progressed over these seven weeks from the original offering of the Omer, which is the measure of barley, which is associated with, with animal food. It's, it's something that can't be digested, raw barley, by a person. That is a, is a um, metaphor for our immature, constricted consciousness, the slave mentality that we still suffered from when we were redeemed from Egypt with an outstretched arm, with that sudden burst of illumination on the first night of Pesach, but then we had to count slowly and get back to it and deserve it and make that light our own. That's the spiritual work of the counting of the Omer, coupled with the anticipation of standing at Sinai receiving the Torah. And then at Mount Sinai we are finally able to stand and bring without danger of haughtiness of leaven, bring these twin loaves of bread because we have developed into this image of a human being who is ready to accept responsibility, which is a definition of what it means to be a person, and true freedom, the true freedom as our sages quip, which is inscribed on the tablets, the freedom to be able to choose, to be able to subjugate our evil inclination and to become servants of Hashem, as our sages tell us, who is a free person? One who is subservient to God. That's one aspect of the festival of Shavuot. And then we read, for example, in the book of Numbers, in chapter 28, we read on the day of the first fruits, when you offer a new meal offering to Hashem on your festival of weeks. The Torah calls Shavuot the day of the first fruits. It's very, very amazing how, over the centuries, after the destruction of the Holy Temple, a custom developed, which is time-honored, and very holy, and very special, and that is to give honor, to show how precious the Torah is to us. We try to stay up the whole night of Shavuot studying the Torah. This is also considered to be a sort of tikkun, as it were, a whimsical perhaps, or perhaps very serious, rectification of the Midrashic account that, for whatever reason, the Jewish people were sloth on Shavuot morning and actually overslept and had to be woken up by the Almighty, and we don't want that to happen again. So we actually stay up the whole night before Shavuot to show our great excitement about the Torah, which is what gives us life. And this is a very beautiful custom, giving honor to the Torah, but interestingly, in the time of the Holy Temple, we don't find a record of that type of observance, but rather the hallmark of Shavuot in Holy Temple times, according to Torah, is that it is Yom HaBikurim. It is the beginning of the season of bringing the first fruits from the seven species for which the land of Israel is identified and praised, bringing the first fruits up to Yerushalayim, up to the chosen house, to the Beit HaMikdash and presenting them there to the Kohen and closing a circle of, of acknowledging and thanking Hashem for what He's given us and then giving it back to Him and showing that we realize that nothing in this world is really ours. But isn't it amazing? I mean, who would have thought that the way to observe Shavuot in the Holy Temple, which is the portal between heaven and earth, which is the place where we go for a direct experience encounter with godliness in, the, in this world. And we're celebrating clearly on the sixth day of Sivan, the anniversary of the Sinai revelation which took place that day, the giving of the Torah, something spiritual, something abstract, something ethereal. The Torah itself, and how do we celebrate it? By bringing the first fruits, which I might have thought is like the very opposite 
because the Torah is spiritual, a spiritual discipline, and the bringing of the first fruits, it's, it's totally agricultural. It's very, very much a part of this world. It's very, very connected. It's very earthy. But yet that's the beauty of Shavuot and the Holy Temple that's observed by bringing the first fruits and this tremendous and intimate connection with the land of Israel. Because, you know, there's a lot of people who think that to be religious or to be spiritual, or they kind of put on a pose, you know, of, of piety or holiness. And they think it's to be kind of abstract and not really worldly, and that this, this world is intrinsically evil, and there's nothing here that's good, and well, you know, it's not, it's not really what God wants. And Torah teaches us the very opposite that this is the world that Hashem created, this is the world that Hashem loves. He put us in it to sanctify Him by living like people who are connected to godly purpose. And the celebration of Torah in the land of Israel is that this is the earth that He gave us and there are mitzvot, special commandments that can be observed that elevate even the aspect of the physical nature of the world to a level of connection to Hashem. So the, the beauty is that actually this is the Torah itself. The Torah is coming into the land of Israel and living lives that are touched by God as regular human beings, honoring God, producing with our toil the produce of the soil, and then bringing it up to the Holy Temple, acknowledging Hashem in our lives, and that is like the celebration of the real Torah. The giving of the Torah is not, you know, something where we are just not even connected to this world, but actually bring the Torah into this world. What better celebration, what better acknowledgement to Hashem of the eternity of the Torah in the, in the Beit HaMikdash, in the Holy Temple, than showing how it's real, how it's actual, how it touches every area of our lives, and how our acknowledgement, our thanks, our recognition of God in our lives is this very beautiful life that He's given us. That's the Torah. That's the, the celebration itself of the Torah in the Holy Temple. And in the years that have passed, unfortunately, as we have not yet rebuilt the Holy Temple, although we are certainly working on that very, very much so as a nation. And in the meantime, we give honor to the Torah and show how precious it is to us by studying it, by making sure that it's part of our consciousness, by spending as much time as we can with it, and certainly this holy night when our entire year will be measured by how we absorb a Torah consciousness and how we reflect and how much we want that to be part of our lives tonight, the night of Shavuot, but the real Torah that we receive should be a Torah of this world, not a make-believe, pretend, put on airs, postured, false piety, but no, this is the world that Hashem loves and we should also fall in love with this world and everything that we do in it should be the symbol of bringing the first fruits of our toil and labor and efforts back to Hashem and acknowledging His presence and living with the Torah. So I think that actually there's another theme that helps us to understand this dimension of making the Torah our own and receiving the Torah, God willing, for ourselves really on Shavuot. And it's very interesting because when we read in Parshat Yitro, of course, in the book of Exodus, where we actually read of the Sinai revelation, in the beginning of chapter 19 in Parshat Yitro, we read, In the third month from the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt, on this day they arrived at the wilderness of Sinai. They journeyed from Rephidim and arrived at the wilderness of Sinai and encamped in the wilderness. And Israel encamped there opposite the mountain. Moshe ascended to God, and Hashem called to him from the mountain, saying, So shall you say to the house of Jacob, and relate to the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to Egypt, and that I have borne you on the wings of eagles, and brought you to me. And now, if you hearken well to me and observe my covenants, you shall be to me the most beloved treasure of all peoples, for mine is the entire world. You shall be to me a kingdom of ministers and a holy nation. 
These are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel. So, in these introductory words to the Sinai experience, God reminds the people, He says, I have borne you on the wings of eagles and brought you to me, meaning here to Mount Sinai. So what is this idea of the wings of eagles, this metaphor? Is it just that God is the most beautiful and perfect poet in the world, and that's a very beautiful expression, the wings of eagles? Or is there something more to it than that? We find also in another example in Deuteronomy 32 of how the experience of coming to Mount Sinai is associated with the wings of eagles. We find in Parsha Ta'azinu, um, close to the conclusion of the Torah, in Moshe's words, we read, For Hashem's portion is His people. Jacob is the measure of His inheritance. He discovered Him in a desert land, in desolation, a howling wilderness. He encircled him, he granted him discernment, he preserved him like the pupil of his eye. He was like an eagle, arousing its nest, hovering over its young. There again we have this, this eagle metaphor. So, on a simple level, our sages tell us that there's something different about an eagle than other birds. Sages tell us that all the other birds are afraid of the eagle. And the way they carry their young, they carry their young uh, underneath their bodies and they, and they guard over their young by spreading their wings over them because they're afraid, the other birds, of the eagle because the eagle soars so high. But since the eagle is the highest bird, doesn't have to worry about anything coming from above, the eagle actually bears its youngs on top of its back, on its wings, because it doesn't have anything to be afraid of from above. So on a simple level of interpretation, the idea that's being expressed by the verses is that Hashem Himself actually bore us, not through any other agency, and like an eagle that's afraid of nothing, Hashem took us out of Egypt and brought us to Mount Sinai. But actually, there is something else as well. For example, we read in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 40, there is some sort of idea about an eagle that strength is renewed, that becomes younger. We read here, Did you not hear? Did you not know? Did you not hear? Hashem is the eternal God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not weary. He does not tire. There is no calculating His understanding. He gives strength to the weary and grants abundant might to the powerless. Youths may weary and tire, and the young men may constantly falter. But those who hope, whose hope is in Hashem will have renewed strength. They will grow a wing like eagles. They will run and not grow tired. They will walk and not grow weary. What is that idea that's being expressed by the prophet Isaiah? That they will have renewed strength. They will grow a wing like eagles. And furthermore, for example, in Psalms 103, we find this, we find who sat regarding Hashem, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with kindness and mercy, who satisfies your mouth with goodness so that your, renew, your youth is renewed like the eagle. So there is actually some sort of ancient idea that's expressed by a midrash about an eagle that reaches a certain age and then becomes renewed. And actually, we see from these verses how Hashem is associating His redemption of Israel and His bringing of the nation to Mount Sinai and giving them the Torah with the wings of an eagle. Actually, there's a very great secret in the word eagle, nesher, nun shin resh. The nesher, that greatest of birds, is actually based and related to the word nosher, to to molt, for, for, for the feathers to drop off, to fall out, because of the fact, says Rashi, that the eagle's, the eagle's wing feathers fall out and are renewed. And this is the secret of its youth. What's really being expressed here 
through the metaphor of the eagle and its renewed youth, and Hashem saying, I brought you here on the wings of an eagle, a person who is really connected to Torah, a person who is really going with Hashem, a person who is really making that happen in a real way in one's life, that covenant, there is no danger of growing old. There is no danger of growing into a complacent or stale or stuck consciousness because true Torah as really is exemplified by the bringing of the first fruits as well. It's a constantly renewing process. It's the very opposite of an old mind, of getting stuck on something. It's constantly looking at the world in a new way. It's the secret of the eagle. It's the secret of renewal. It's the secret of Hashem's telling us that He brought us on eagle's wings, that there is nothing to fear but getting stuck in one place. And when we study the Torah on the night of Shavuot, and when we are redoubling our efforts to make the acceptance of the Torah, the sign of revelation for us real, that we hear the thunder at Mount Sinai, and it's us that are standing there, and we receive it, and we say, we will do, and we will obey. The Torah that we are receiving is the Torah that sanctifies this world. It's the Torah that celebrates our own humanity through the first fruits that we are not just uh, separating ourselves and saying, no, you know, we are, we are um, religious, we are, we are worshiping Hashem, we are, uh, you know, just separating ourselves. That's not the Torah. The Torah is the celebration of our lives as people. Otherwise, Hashem would have kept the Torah in heaven. Instead, He didn't give it to the angels. He gave it to Israel to bequeath its light to the world and the secret of the renewal of the youth of the, of the eagle. As David says, renew my youth like the eagle, that it's a constant experience of looking at the world in a new way, of looking at Torah in a new way, of becoming younger and younger in our minds realizing how little we know, realizing how excited we are to receive the Torah, how much it's going to change our lives, and never taking anything for granted, but constantly becoming more and more youthful, looking at the world with a wide eyes, and realizing that Hashem gave us the Torah to bring to this world, to sanctify His name in this world, to live as people, to celebrate our humanity within the mitzvot that He has given us to bring the consciousness of our connection to Hashem into every aspect of our lives. This is truly the celebration of Mount Sinai. This is what makes the Torah real. And God willing, as soon as we are able to build the Holy Temple, as we are obligated, as is our destiny, we will continue the commandment of bringing the first fruits of the land of Israel to the Holy Temple. And until then, we redouble our efforts and our commitment to the rebuilding of the Holy Temple and our commitment of making the Torah real in every aspect of our lives. This is the secret of youth, of eternal youth, the secret of every day being lived to the fullest in a completely new way. The real Torah, the true Torah, the, true, the Torah of action and of making this world into a place for Hashem. This is really the secret of King David as well, and the secret of Mashiach, the secret of everything that connects the glorious festival of Shavuot from Jerusalem. We wish you Chag Sameach, and may we all merit together to truly receive the Torah anew.